Oh, here well, we are. hi <laughs> again. <laughs> Hello. Hey there. I, I'm back home again. I'm yes, the... I can tell. <laughs> but happy to be here. Well, yeah, it was fun trying to connect with you out there in the world with your little satellite dish on your head and stuff. Well, uh, but... there'll be others and we're, 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 we're uh, fine tuning the system for the next time. I, I, I want you to be able to do it. It's really, really fun that you were out there on site and I, I, I know you're going to get it sorted out. It was mildly frustrating not to be able to do it properly, but it's nice to have you at home with a stable connection. And oh man, here we are again, running out of superlatives for the show. Yeah, uh, boy, a really, really nice Cassidy there is the penultimate statement of that sense. Well, That's the, the segue places. into it too, the end of Bertha, it, it just, they just sort of double clutched right into this nice new thing there. It was, there's a lot of that. There's for, for a music that's largely improvisational, there's a lot of precision stuff going on, uh, you know, among these top notch players. It's quite rewarding to listen to. Yeah, the channel, the channel into Cassidy actually bore some resemblance to the jams that go into Jack Straw. And then maybe someone said, oh, wait, check the set list. We played that one already. Now let's go play Cassidy. <laughs> but maybe oh, that probably wasn't the case. You know? <laughs> but well, uh, the whole well, set was uh, pretty cool, uh, starting with something interesting before Hell in a Bucket. Yeah, I enjoyed that jam quite a bit. I'll just run down the set list since I have it written down okay. right in front of me here. They open with that beautiful gem into Hell in a Bucket, Alabama Getaway, Jack Straw, Big Boss Man with some really, really nice sort of band stuff that I'd never never heard the Grateful Dead do, do it that way. Really nice. A sweet version of Fenario, and then that lovely trio of Bertha into that Cassidy we were talking about and ending with Don't Ease Me In. It's just top-notch dead music. What can I tell you? Let me say that jam into Hell in a Bucket was quite explicitly a love supreme. I mean, that, that was not just a jam. They, there was the bass line and, and, and chord voicings of a love supreme. And I knew it was going to be Hell in a Bucket because the, the groove was, was a hell, the bucket groove. So hearing a love supreme layered over that was uh, kind of audacious, I thought. And I loved it. Okay, very good. I stand, uh, in my, my understanding is improved by your wisdom. Thank you. <laughs> so we're here to uh, uh, explain the value of uh, getting on to nugs.net. If you're watching this as part of the nugs stream, you're already in the family and subscribing to one thing or another, or you've just bought tonight's broadcast or whatever. We're glad you're with us. We're going to talk to the people who are not yet members of the Nugs Net family because Nugs asked us to do this fun thing in between sets. And part of our mission is to tell you how cool Nugs Net is and how pleased we are to be part of their family because we get to help present this live stuff. They also have a huge library of performances in their archive and a streaming service to allow you to access it nowadays. That's right. And the depth of that library is quite impressive. Uh, a lot of Grateful Dead family stuff, including Dead and Company shows going back, I think, to their second or third tour, 2016. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of the successor bands are on there and uh, Bobby Weir and Wolf Bros and then second generation jam band Fish and Goose and Humphreys McGee and many others, and then stuff that's outside the jam band genre, very much outside of Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, both great archival stuff and the things they're doing right now on tour become available within a day or two after the show they play, wherever it is in the world. Mm -hmm. And and so much, so much wonderful stuff. Wilco, one of my favorite bands. I dive into the Wilco pool a lot. And another member of the NUG subscriber base uh, it texted me to let me know that they've added yes to the library. And I thought it would be really, really fun to do a little who's on first routine. And I wonder if they have the guess who in their library. Or the who, right. That, that, you'd have right. The whole, that whole right. uh, great bit by the uh, credibility gap, the comedy group that uh, exactly. did the variation so, on yeah. Abbott Costello. But yeah. anyway, as aside from that... Uh, Nugs is an incredible resource to people who love live music. And uh, 
if you're watching this, we would guess that includes you. Of course, if you've already subscribed, we, you don't need any of this information from us. But if you're watching the second half preview, uh, that means that you are maybe being introduced to this service for the first time. And we urge you to avail yourself of it because uh, I use it all the time when I'm not doing this job. Uh, I, I get too. plenty of great, I get plenty of Grateful Dead related stuff in all of my work. So I go and I explore some of the other stuff and it's really a treat. So we recommend yes. it highly. We do. You can go to nugs.net uh, slash deadco. There's also livedead.co and there are, uh, you know, introductory offers. So you can check out their streaming service and stuff, but there's also direct access to downloadable audio files of tons and tons of different shows in various formats. And that's, again, something I use for my radio show. You know, a couple of days after each show, after John Altshuler has done his excellent job of remixing them for the downloads, you can download tonight's show from nugs.net. I, I use that part of the library all the time. I have a massive collection of Dead & Company downloads that I've used to uh, produce my radio shows with and stuff. So I'm a big fan of the downloadable stuff at nugs.net. We should probably introduce our pre-recorded feature before we get too deep into the uh, weeds here. That's right. Well, yeah, as, as you know, we've been interviewing a different guest each night. In past tours, we did almost all of them live, um, which had a little bit of suspense to it, whether the connection was going <laughs> to work, whether whether the, the band was going to come back before we were done with the interview. So uh, last year, we did the innovation of pre-recording interviews with band members. And that went so smoothly and caused less stress, especially to the people running the show here. Right now it's Lonnie Davis, and thank you as always, Lonnie, that we're recording all of them, and uh, we even bank some in advance. We recorded three different interviews today, which will be coming up in the in the coming weeks, and uh, we were really happy to record this one because it got us back together talking with a good old friend of ours. Yes, Jeff Pearson. Uh, I, one technical note on this. Uh, I, I was using my new M1 laptop, and somehow I was looking at the screen as it was supposed to be with Gary and me on top and our guest on the bottom. But when I looked back at it to do the editing on it, it had switched itself somehow into speaker mode. So you'll be seeing our faces when we're asking questions and stuff, and then you'll be seeing Jeff. I subsequently, for today, I went back to using my older, more reliable machine, which seems to allow me to configure Zoom as I intend it without overriding my free will. So for going forward, it'll be fine. But this one's going to be a little jittery with switching back and forth among us. But it's our pal Jeff Pearson, a lovely individual, a good friend and neighbor of mine who lives about a mile away from here and uh, has been a, a member of an amazing band called Boxed Set for 25 years or so and also spent several years as one of the background singers in Further. That's right, uh, which is still remembered fondly by a lot of our audience. Uh, people talk about further quite a bit with good reason. I got to see them a bunch and hang out with Jeff a lot. Great person, great musician, and uh, I think you'll really enjoy this interview. We won't be back after the interview. We'll go right back to the stage uh, so the band can get back to business. So we'll thank you for tonight. We'll ask you to enjoy the second set and enjoy this interview with Jeff as well. Thanks, everybody. We're so happy to have with us an old friend who some of you may know from his longtime band box set and a lot more of you may know from his years in further with Bob Weir, Phil Lesh and friends. Great singer, a great friend, Jeff Pearson. Hey, Jeff. How you doing, guys? Good to see you both. Hello. Well, we've seen each other recently. I had you over to yes. watch the show just last night. So just last night. We're, we are neighbors as well as friends out here in Oakland, California. It's great to have you with us. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks, fellas. Good to see you both, especially since I saw David yesterday. I haven't seen Gary in, in a number of years at this point, I think. So it's that great is that, even longer than the number of years we, ha we haven't seen anybody since the pandemic started. Right. There's, there were several <laughs> years in front of that. And uh, it, it really feels like a long time because Jeff and I used to see each other a lot because I spent a lot of time around further during those years the band was touring. We had, were almost always there. It, so it seemed. Even I wasn't I wasn't like literally on tour, but you guys came to New York a lot and I came to the Bay Area a lot. I was still kind of bi-coastal at the time. 
So we saw a lot of each other and further was a wonderful little time in the history of all this still ongoing history of all this, which is just mm. so amazing. And uh, it's really great to see you. And it's always been great to have you as part of this extended family. Absolutely. We had some good times together. And one of the highlights for me was going to your birthday party that you shared with Ornette Coleman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was just a phenomenal night, just getting to hang out with Ornette and having Bob there. And uh, yeah. I believe, what was Bob's quote from that night? I I know what geniuses smell like, and he smells like a genius. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love I, I love that. Um, so I, I, I let's ta let's learn a little bit about Jeff Pearson's story. Um, he, we both gleefully recount that the first time we ever met was at a gig down at the San Gregorio General Store on the peninsula south of San Francisco and west of where the Grateful Dead were born. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it was a big thing, and I forget the exact deal, but Jeff came over and said something like, "Damn hippies." <laughs> And I said, those are my people. <laughs> yep. And he was I, only half cranky about it, but it, he was I definitely, and hippies were kind of new to him. And so it's particularly interesting and quasi amusing that he wound up playing in a band uh, aimed, completely aimed at hippies. Absolutely. I was being <laughs> tongue in cheek because I knew who you were. <laughs> and I came up behind David and whispered his in his because there were some some very hippie people dancing to the band that was on before we went on. And I said, damn hippies in his ear, knowing it would get a reaction. And he turned, <laughs> and said, hey, okay. man, those are my people. And right. I went, Dave, you can have them. <laughs> I, okay, okay, this reminds me of a great, totally irrelevant to anything, but a, a great line from a very jaded sort of punk rock friend of mine who found himself at a party in Santa Cruz with, you know, with the, with the uh, hangers, plant hangers with ferns in them and macrame everywhere. Right. And, and my friend turned to me and said, I'm suffering from a peaceful, easy feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Put it up That's with that. That's great. I love that. <laughs> that is great. But, so, so, so you came to fame in your own right as a member of a very cool band called Box Set which yes. still exists. I just saw you guys at the Freight and Salvage a few weeks ago. But um, how did you wind up as a member of uh, Further for what? Well, um, you, I'm sure you both actually recall the old Sweetwater in Mill Valley, not the one that Bob owns now, but the old one that was up the street that was run by an incredible woman named Jeannie Patterson. Oh, yes. Jeannie took a liking to box set. And so it was very hard to get a gig at the old Sweetwater, as small as it was, very hard to get a show there. And in fact, I oftentimes, I hate to repeat this story now, Jeannie's gone, so maybe she'll forgive me. She used to have stacks of CDs on her desk that she was supposed to listen to, to and she did often listen to them. But there were other nights when I was in her office where she just went ah, <laughs> right into the garbage can. Um, <laughs> But she took a liking to us and she would, and one of her best friends was Bob Weir. And Bob hung out there. It was like his little clubhouse down the hill from his house. And so Jeannie just started in Bob's ear about box set. You have to come see box set. Box set's going to be the next thing and yada, yada. And so Bob started coming to our shows and hanging out. And we got to know Bob. We got the, uh, you know, the, the thing that everybody every young musician wanted you get the invite up to bob's house after your show and you hang out and then you end up at bill graham's old house which michael klein then owned and and it was just kind of getting indoctrinated into this greater bay area music scene as young musicians and it was wonderful and so we developed a good friendship bob was well aware that box set uh involved a lot of vocal harmonies and um so when further came along and um zoe left i got the call i got the call because and the how it was put to me was listen we don't want to rehearse we want <laughs> we want somebody who can come in and just find the harmonies and do it and i said okay yeah i can do that and they said okay um in a month 
we're going to play the fur this further festival and we're going to be doing I, th I think we did six sets a whole album each set as i recall so you have a month to learn 300 songs <laughs> And so I was like, okay, you know, thankfully, having seen 70 or so Grateful Dead shows with Jerry and another 70 or so Jerry Garcia band shows, I, I knew about half of them. But then the deep cuts, I had no idea. Like learning blues for Allah, I will never, never forget. Um, that was, that was a, a rough one to, to learn. And then I found out when we did it, the first time that I pretty much had a better handle on it than most everybody else. So I didn't feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's essentially how it happened is that Bob used to come see us. And then, you know, when they needed somebody, he knew he could count on me to find the harmonies. Yeah. And I thought that was one of the best vocal blends ever to serve this music, you know, you and Sunshine, Thank you, you know, uh, augmenting what the guys were doing. And I always felt like you helped Bob and Phil sing better because they 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 were they were at a a more nurturing vocal place you know, than than they had been in some time. And it really they they <laughs> were very, they were very relaxed in that in it, vocally. I thought in in the context of further. Yeah, I think it allowed them to relax a little more, and then and they would also kind of pick and choose when and where they sang um, more than they used to because Bob knew that I would do it and if Phil didn't feel like singing I'd jump over to the low part You'd, that was part of the show is to watch the guys oh and so if, it wasn't the same every night mm -mm, no <laughs> if, if you're my surprise <laughs> well yeah because well you know I I have a non-disclosure agreement so I can only say something <laughs> like that, but, <laughs> but Phil did not like being doubled. So who does? Bob does not care. Really? Wow. Mm -mm. Bob, Bob, Bob's pretty damn easygoing. I mean, he really is. He's the sweetest guy. I mean, he's 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 a mensch, is what he is. Um, but Phil, you know, it's not like Phil was a dick about it, right? Can I say? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> he wasn't a dick about it, but he was just like, I don't like being double. So if he was singing and wanted to sing, you know, he always did the low part because he's got that beefy voice. So if he was singing, I would get because there were so many vocalists, I would generally double Bob. And when that would happen, a lot of the times on choruses, Bob would kind of back out a little bit and say, his voice and then mm. get back on singing the verses you know because we had jk we had jeff and and uh but when when phil would not sing i'd pop over to the low part so that got covered so you had six singers in that band yeah wow yeah yeah that's oh, right wow. mm -hmm. a lot of mix and match opportunities there cool yeah a lot of doubling you know so that's that's to be expected with that many singers and you only have a one, three, five. So okay, now I understand about doubling. Okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, it, it 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 led to some gorgeously multi-layered versions of songs like "Addicts of My Life," oh. especially the one where you also had Larry and Teresa and Elvis Costello on Good that God. one. What a at, night at Radio City Music Hall! What I, a night! That that was so. If you ever want to see a man having an out-of-body experience, look at video of Jeff Pearson from that night because uh -huh. and, and I, I got to, I've loved seeing you have those experiences over the course of further of walking onto stage at Madison Square Garden for the first time. And, that was a bigger one. And you know Bob and Phil, oh yeah, we've been here. Yeah. The room looks good. Yeah. You know, and for and for the younger people in the band, that was a completely new thing. And yep. you, you rose to the occasion too. The, those shows were wonderful. First time for me, first time for Sunshine, first time for Joey. Right. First time for for JK, yeah, wow. yeah. And we were we all had a big moment about it before we went on and talked about it. In fact, I vividly remember driving up, you know, because it's on the seventh floor. Which some, if you don't live in New York, people don't realize that that right. there's so many floors to it. So you're driving in, and we were driving up those ramps, and all of us were looking out the window, going, "Song remains the same." 
<laughs> it's from the Zeppelin movie. We're driving up the same ramp, you know. It was just <laughs> just all those little moments. Yeah. Uh yeah, that was that was a huge one. And but that Radio City show, I did have an out-of-body experience because several of us were on mushrooms that night. <laughs> ah, very good. I'm glad you can talk about that now. You I, you got, I don't think you, that was part of the NDA. You you did <laughs> you've done some stuff over in the Jefferson Airplane yes. uh, universe as well. Let's talk about that. And didn't you teach songwriting out at, at Yorma's place? Yeah. Um Yorma and Jack uh took Buck set out as the opening act, I want to say on four different tours. Um and so we, and they would, you know, we were a duo, they were a duo, so they just put us on their bus. So we got very close and became very good friends. I mean, Jim and I wrote songs for Jack Cassidy's first solo album and did that with him. And um, so, yeah, uh, so when it came time to do the 50th anniversary, um, Vanessa, Yorma's wife, and I guess they had decided to ask me to do the late great Marty Ballin's stuff um, wow. since he had passed. And uh, so I got the call for that and I, you know, had to say yes. Mm. And I didn't have to learn 300 songs in a month, which was great. I just had to learn like 10 songs in, right. in a month. Right. So that right. wasn't so hard. And, and, but what a band. I mean, Gene oh, Smith, Larry and Teresa, yeah. my buddy Justin on the, Justin Gwip on the drums. He's yeah. a great drummer. And you know, the, the fabulous of. Rachel Price from Lake Street oh. Dive. And that I was at the premiere of that configuration at the Locken Festival. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, they, they basically, Teresa sang all like the Grace Slick hit, hits. She sang White Rabbit and, uh, yeah. and, and Somebody to Love. And um, I don't know who picked the repertoire for the show, but they had Rachel doing some really like obscure gray slicks of like lawman and yeah, uh, lawman was great. Es eskimo blue day yeah, eskimo, yeah. that was my favorite song yeah of the yeah, entire yeah. Thing. yeah rachel crushed that she oh, crushes man. everything i mean who are we kidding um she as a fellow vocalist i hear her sing and i'm like i should quit <laughs> <laughs> yeah she's extraordinary she's that good where you're just like you know and Teresa williams is no slouch but when yeah. when when Rachel really gets going, it's insane. I mean, she is such a talent. Yeah, and and you know so, you you were tasked with opening that set at Lock In with three fifths of a mile in ten seconds. Wow, and, what yeah, fun! Absolutely crushed it, and you know that's of course the cut that also opens one of my favorite live albums that ever. Blesses Point Little Head. So opening the set with that, and you you know my pal singing the Marty part was really just. I think I had an out of body experience there, and I, and, and I and I wasn't on mushrooms. That's uh, right. I wasn't that night either. That's Completely so different situation with with uh, the hot tuna guys are sober, and that that's, yeah. uh, that's all good. I totally yeah. respect that. Well, yeah. Jeff, we're we're running out of time here. We have yes, to sir. turn it back over to the stage. Tell us uh, what you're doing now and where we can find out. I know Box Set is performing from time to time because I got to go to an amazing show at the Freight and Salvage a few weeks ago. Yeah, box set's still playing. We're we're currently writing for our fifteenth record, if you can believe wow. that. Um, I'm saying we're writing, and we have we're doing. Uh, I think the next thing in the Bay Area we're doing is the Big Jerry Day celebration at um, the Jerry Garcia Amphitheater in right. San Francisco, McLaren Park. Yes, McLaren Park, right? And um, and then we have a big outdoor show up in. Um, Novato that Casey Turner, the local promoter, is putting on up there on September 16th. But other than that, we're writing. We're going to start recording soon. But yeah, boxsetband.com. You can find out what we're doing. All right. Jeff Pearson, lovely to see you again. Great to, to see have, you. To have you on Dead Air. Yeah, man. So, so, uh, so glad you got used to us damn hippies and wandered into our musical world. Oh, man. <laughs> I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was the best thing that ever happened. All right, man. All right. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, we're uh, just going to throw it back to the stage. A second set by uh, Dead & Company. And uh, Jeff, hope to see you in person soon. It's been way too long, man. Hope so too, buddy. Love you. All right. Take see care. you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.